Thank you all very much for coming. Uh, we all appreciate uh, that. And this series of talks about the history of business, the history of different industries, started uh, in December with a talk on the history of the movie industry uh, tonight, airlines. Uh, the last Wednesday of February will be the story of the auto industry and lessons for high-tech leaders. And the last Wednesday in March will be the story of retailing, which is my, my own real love, where I've spent most, most of my career. So, uh, and the talks are co-sponsored by the AT&T Conference Center, the building you're in. How many of you, this is your first time in the Conference Center? Great, great. Well, it's, uh, you know, I, I um, just joined the university uh, last September, so I, I just learned about it as well. And it's just a wonderful facility and a great hotel and excellent restaurants both uh, kind of fancy and casual. So uh, I urge you to check it all out. And also sponsored by the Herb Kelleher Center for Entrepreneurship, which is part of the McCombs uh, School of Business here at UT. And I, uh, when I joined the university in September, I joined as entrepreneur in residence at the Herb Kelleher Center. And I uh, counsel students who want to be entrepreneurs or are entrepreneurs or want to understand entrepreneurship, students um, uh, in the business school, students outside the business school, alumni, uh, pretty much anybody I can get to, as uh, some of the folks here in the audience are members of a group called Bootstrap Austin, which uh, Bajoy Goswami is a, a fearless uh, leader, founder of Bootstrap, and um, it's over a thousand entrepreneurs in Austin, and I try to help there as much as I can. I just started teaching my first regular course uh, uh, last Monday, a Foundations of Entrepreneurship course on Monday nights. Which registration's still open? I guess I should play it. Anyway, if I've done all the advertising I got to do, the rest of the program will be presented in its entirety without any advertising, except for the airline industry. Um, let me see. Anything else I want to say up front? I, I have been a, a, a business uh, junkie, I guess, since I was a little kid. I grew up in a GM factory town. Uh, 60,000 people lived in the town, Anderson, Indiana. Uh, 27,000 people worked at General Motors. Nobody could really tell me anything about General Motors, you know. I mean, they'd tell me, oh, they make Chevrolet and Pontiac and all that. But I'd say, well, who started it? Why did they start it? Uh, who runs it now? Are they smart? Are they stupid? What's their strategy? It was really all the same kind of things that teachers were telling us about, like Civil War generals and, and the leaders of the Triple Alliance in Europe and all that. But I asked the same kind of questions that they seemed to think were important about generals and politicians ask him about the heads of these big companies, which appeared to me to be very important to our lives, and nobody knew the answers. And I discovered Fortune magazine at the age of 12 and started subscribing, which uh, for better or for worse means it'll be my 47th year with Fortune coming up here soon. And, um, and I've gone back and gotten all the Fortunes back to its beginning, almost all of them, to 1930. And I live in a library. I've got an old Catholic school outside Dripping Springs with about 50,000 books in it. And, and as you may know, I, I, I was in the uh, book selling uh, business. Some of my compadres are here from Bookstop, which was sold to Barnes & Noble uh, a little over 20 years ago. And I started a company called Hoover's, uh, an online uh, business uh, information about business. Kind of fits, right? Uh, and, 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 uh, and it went public. Now it's part of Dun & Bradstreet. It has several hundred employees in the old Buttercrust Bakery across from Highland Mall. And then some of you may remember Travel Fest, which uh, didn't succeed when the airlines stopped paying commissions. But I still, I still love the airlines. So anyhow, um, and, and, and one of the things is I, I felt this way a long time. But the more I read, the more I study, the more I think, uh, the more I see, like reading Fortune. I don't read the, I still subscribe to Fortune. I don't read every issue anymore because the stories are the same ones I read in the 60s. You know, they just got new actors, new characters, you know. The, the, the way that business works and the way things evolve, the fundamental things really don't change. The techniques and the methods change. We'll see what kind of airplanes they use change. But, and I so often see people making strategic mistakes and other kind of mistakes in business uh, that they probably could have avoided if they had a sense of business history. And business history is kind of like uh, Nowheresville in, in the United States. It's a little better off in Europe. Maybe Japan, I'm not sure. I just got an email from one of the young people I mentor from Singapore. He said, oh, it's even worse here than it is in the US as far as having a sense of history. So that's why I personally invest as much energy as I can find to um, preach, teach, whatever, the lessons of business history. And, and, and tonight, you know, certainly not a full course. This is a really kind of a survey and in large part kind of a, a visual trip through the history of the airline industry. And I think it's going to take between an hour and an hour and 10 minutes, but we will find out right now. So with that preface, whoop, one too many. Why did I get interested in airlines? I'm interested in all this stuff 
February 1959, my dad took a job as the sales manager for a glassware company in Indiana, which meant all of a sudden he had to start flying to both coasts and all over the United States to visit with the salesmen. And that meant the Indianapolis airport, the beautiful Weir Cook Airport, looked like that. And the front counter um, was, there were six airlines that served back in 1959. And the industry was pretty stable then, so it was the same six for years. I was a bored little kid. You know, we go down, he's supposed to land it, because you didn't have two cars in the family, you know. And, and mom would drive down, and us three kids in the back of the station wagon, and um, we'd sleep in the car when the plane was due in at 10 p.m. and arrive at 2 a.m., you know, because you ain't going to leave dad at the airport. It wouldn't quite work out right. So anyway, so I spent hours and hours and hours hanging out in this place, as I as uh, would have been eight years old then. And they all handed out airline timetables, and I started picking them up and collecting them. And then somehow they were one of the few things that didn't get thrown out when the, my parents moved several times over the years or whatever. And, and I came back later in life and said, oh, these are pretty cool. And um, got back into it. So that's where I began. And TWA was the main airline in Indianapolis. So uh, that's what it looked like. You got out to the glass. out on the, uh, And, the, and uh, airports always had great places where you could watch the planes because there was a lot of drama. And of course, uh, and there were no uh, the, the runway dealies. You know, there were the stairs, the rolling stairs. And uh, my dad would always say, that's a TWA constellation. I'll talk more about it in a minute. That if, uh, when he got on it, if he didn't see flames shooting out of the back of the engine, he would worry. Because, you know, that was, uh, they were oil burners. Um, and, um, but, so I always believe it's important to try to connect to history. Find things that, that relate to yourself. And so you wouldn't have had to live in Indianapolis to get into airlines. Here we have this grand opening. It's got, I think it's got to be 1960, give or take. I forgot to check the date that uh, Robert Miller Airport opened here in town. Uh, maybe it takes an old timer from Austin to know who's speaking there. But um, big deal, ribbon cutting to the new, the new facility. And you'll notice people stand on the roof because most airports had ob observation decks where you could go out and watch the planes come in and go. And, and some people just do it just for the thrill of it because airplanes were so cool. The bustling inside of the Robert Miller Airport, beautiful Trans-Texas Airways. Things are hopping. But even though it started small, over time it became a much bigger deal. And here you see this wonderful huge parking lot filled with 1950s cars. Um, so now my friends, some of my friends who are in the audience, and I think I'm crazy for being into airplanes. I'm not into airplanes. A lot of people are being into airline timetables and all that. You may have heard of Mr. Travolta. Uh, I, I saw him on a talk show recently, and he told the host, uh, Letterman or whoever, he said, oh, I collect airline timetables. I grew up as a kid underneath LaGuardia Airport and seeing the airliners come and go all the time. I loved it and I got all the timetables and my house is full of airplane timetables. I think, yes, yes, I'm not the only weirdo, you know? And, you know, it may be kind of wimpy for me, but, you know, it's, 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 uh, uh, so it isn't unmanly to collect airline timetables. And there he is sitting at the, um, in the cockpit of a Boeing 707. Come back to that later. That's it from the outside. It's painted up in Qantas colors. Qantas, Q-A-N-T-A-S. Uh, Queensland and Northern Territories Aerial Services. One of the few words in the English language that has a Q without a U behind it. <laughs> because it was Queensland. It's a Austro big Australian airline. And, uh, and it's a beautiful aircraft. He is piloting it there. But it's not a Qantas airplane. They agreed to let him paint it. It's his airplane. He painted it in their colors because they say, okay, you can fly it to shows and maybe they help pay for the paint. He parks it at his house in Ocala, Florida. <laughs> so in that regard, he's a step or two ahead of me. But so I'm not the only person crazy about the airline business. Uh, I go up to people now, I say, I collect airline timetables. And if anybody's under about 30, they say, what's an airline timetable? Uh, you know, and uh, it, all, all transportation, buses, trains, they had schedules or timetables. This is about the, it's not the exact same one, same era. Uh, late 50s, American Airlines, so it's a brochure like this, always piled up at the, at the desk. You didn't have to ask for them. They were easy to get for an eight-year-old kid. And uh, in it is the, the tables that show the times. <laughs> and so uh, zeroing in, each column is a different flight, and that's the flight number at the top and what kind of aircraft it was. The Electra, that's a poor airplane, kept falling out of the sky. Wasn't real good for its <laughs> reputation. And, and it's by time. It starts at like 7 a.m., goes to 8 a.m., and so it's left to right. This is their transcontinental services westbound. And in every city they went on that main route was listed, but not every plane stopped at all of them. So if you said, oh, I want to leave New York about 8.30 a.m. and I got to get to Chicago, it took a little while to find one where New York was at 8, and then, oh, that one doesn't go to Chicago, that one doesn't, and you find the right one. Later, work of genius, somebody came up with the idea of uh, quick reference timetables, where it listed the city, 
from Boston, this is from a Canadian timetable, to Amsterdam, to Hong Kong, to Lisbon, to Madrid. And this one actually has the prices on it. And one thing, uh, that, which is pretty rare, and, um, but the one thing that's real interesting is if you look at transatlantic airfares, um, $500 to $1,000 a round trip across the Atlantic has pretty much been the price since they began flying across the Atlantic, which means it's come down dramatically on a relative basis. But any time I look back at it, it's amazing, you know, that the coach was, has really been in that same range. Now, other industries kind of like that is washers and dryers, you know, for years. They didn't change in price. The only, as people, they only stopped giving out timetables. Why spend on ink? Everybody's online anyway. And the last airline to keep giving out timetables was our beloved Southwest. And, uh, but they stopped uh, six months ago or something. And the last several years, they put an employee on the cover. So that's what an airline timetable is, in case you're under 30. Um, we think about the airlines, we forget they had competition. There were other ways to get places. Locomotives, amazing machines. You, people traveled on leisure uh, by the railroads. It's going through the American West on the Great Northern. People went on business. I love this. This was New York Central Lines. They ran the 20th Century Limited from uh, New York to uh, Chicago. And, and he said, he arrived with ca confidence worth cash. Said, That's great, you know. And because uh, he'd been sleeping on the train all night, you know, so his clothes may have been all screwed up, but he had confidence. Anyhow, um, you know, one of the major lines coming into Texas, into Austin, and stop, would have stopped in Highland Park in Dallas and everything, was the Katy, because that's Missouri, Kansas, Texas Railroad called the Katy. Uh, wonderful names, the Texas Special, the Blue Bonnet, the Texas Limited. I said the airline should do stuff like that, you know, name some of their key flights, like the 6 p.m. flight out of New York or something. And the railroads were also promoting that people put businesses along their route. And here, one of my all-time favorite slides, is business dreams come true in Texas. And that was the Katy Railroad trying to get people to build factories and have offices. Because then the Southwest, um, you know, in the 1920s or 30s was still the frontier in many ways, economically. Oh, oh, and this is a big competitor, Missouri Pacific, which also came through Austin. And here they're trying to get people to go to the uh, Centennial up in Dallas, where uh, Fair Park, you know, today, a lot of the buildings still stand. But, but these were complicated machines. Uh, those guys would run something like uh, 100 to 200 miles before they'd go back into the shop for repairs. They would switch them out continually if you were running across the country. That's why the diesels took over. But here you see, because we're into the 50s, we're out of the Eagles. They'd had that for a while, but still it sounds a little like an airplane to me. And then rockets, you know, we're streamlined, we're hurry. Because the railroads by this time are trying to say, oh, we can compete with the airlines. We're better, we're safer. Um, also, don't forget there were buses. Up until about 1970, the biggest carrier of passengers between cities in the United States was Greyhound Lines. And if you went uh, over water, or even along the coast, you could go by ship or, or on river boats too. We forget that, that, you know, if you wanted to go from New York to Boston or whatever, well, this is on the show in um, Boston down to Norfolk and then on down to Savannah, you went by boat, coastal steamers. And obviously, if you went longer distances, a dear old fruit company, the Banana Republic, this is a banana company's boat, you know, uh, running down to Central America. Uh, this is, um, guys going, this outfit ran from London to South America and, um, uh, Central America too, maybe. Oh, here, this is the Italians. Central America, South America, North America, leaving from Genoa. Um, big trip, of course, was transatlantic, the White Star Line, a great transatlantic line, um, an early thing for them. This is, um, they merged. J.P. Morgan put together a thing called International Mercantile Marine, and they merged White Star, Red Star, and the Atlantic Transport, and that was the outfit that had the uh, Titanic. Went down as part of his empire. But with all that, 1903, the Wright brothers figure out the airplane. Uh, people use him in war, think, oh, that's what we'll use airplanes for. Uh, whatever, half the pilots died in <laughs> World War I. It was pretty grim. By the late 19 teens, the, um, uh, they're starting to send mail by, airline, by airplanes. There were no airlines, really. And, and small little airlines are beginning to start up. It's interesting, the French were very early. See, this is Paris to Brussels, Amsterdam, and London. The British, Handley Page, London to Paris, Brussels, and Amsterdam, all the key cities, you know. And it's interesting, I see a lot of interesting patterns as I study different industries. And um, in the movie industry, a lot of the real pioneers were in Europe. And the U.S. came along later and then caught up and blew by them. Uh, same thing in the airline industry. And when we talk about autos next month, it's going to be the same thing again. 
So it's interesting. And how much of it is just the fact that we became the greatest economy on Earth? And, and how much is it that they, we were more creative for other reasons or had a freer market or whatever is going on? But it's interesting to the extent that it is related to just the sheer size of the economy, that we had such a huge domestic market, um, then that says an awful lot about how the United States and China will might compare, uh, you know, X years down the pike. There's a post on my website about the future of China written by a, uh, a Nobel winning economist that's much more ambitious in his expectations for China than most observers. Uh, and if you want to know about my website or contact me, my business cards are all stacked up by the door. Uh, don't forget that. Um, but the U.S. came in. One of the earliest Aero Marine was flying like uh, Key West to uh, Havana. Um, many of the early airline routes were over water because why would you ever want to fly over land? You know, if the engine dies, you're dead. The engine dies over water, you're okay. These things got big floats on them and everything. So uh, up in the Great Lakes, they were flying Detroit to Cleveland. They were doing Key West. The, uh, one of the earliest U.S. carriers was from Tampa to St. Petersburg. Um, and, it, and this was one of the very earliest, Aero Marine. Um, there were lots of little airlines beginning to be formed, mainly in like the mid-20s. Colonial is New York to Boston, New York to Montreal, and Albany, Buffalo, Cleveland. Uh, Ludington Line, uh, New York to Washington with three stops in between. These planes didn't go very far. And you'll notice these planes are kind of old looking. <laughs> um, this one not only is a New York-Washington airline, travel by air, but equipment leased from United States Air Transport. So, you know, it's getting pretty complex. Uh, standard Airlines. Now, here you got a train on the same brochure. Well, many times, if you went any distance at all, you use both. Uh, like they had services where you go coast to coast by air and rail, and, and you would alternate because you couldn't fly at night because there were no beacons. There were no lights on the runways. They would light bonfires, <laughs> but I guess the traveling public wasn't crazy about the bonfire concept. Anyhow, so you, would, you could fly to a place, you'd get out of the plane at 8 at night, you'd get on a train that was parked next to it. This went on all the time in Columbus, Ohio. And take the train on across to um, um, Oklahoma or whatever. 7 a.m., the train would stop, you get on an airplane, you fly all day, and it could be like all day, all night, all day, all night kind of thing. Um, so they, they were, and in fact, one of the airlines I'm going to come to was partially backed by the Pennsylvania Railroad. Um, little carrier, Waddell Williams out of New Orleans, because they were starting all these little ones all over, little short hops. One that was in Texas, this guy had a bus company, and he said, I want to be in the airline business. He wasn't the only one. There were others that came out of the bus business. And his name was Bowen. And, well, you can see here, it shows Dallas to New York. Um, well, I think his planes maybe went to Chicago, and then you rode another guy's plane. Uh, fast planes, because they bought some of these real high-speed planes and said, we're the fastest airline. You'll see that again. There was their schedule. And you can see they did stop in Austin. And here we're in the uh, early 30s. They were one of the few people to stop in Austin because they were working their way. But that was a, a small one. I just like this one because that Stinson airplane is so cool. And uh, in another little, uh, well, they're getting pretty long, go all the way from Detroit to Washington. Still nothing like crossing Texas, right? The Universal Airlines was uh, the first uh, agglomeration of airlines where they went out and they bought like seven or eight little guys and put them together and tried to create a system. But sometimes the system wouldn't even touch, you know, like, oh, two airlines over there and two over there and can't get between them. But investors began to look at, let's put some, you know, bigger deals together. Um, and Universal was the first. It later became part of American. These are our, our little schedules uh, from that era. The left one is Pennsylvania Airlines, American in the middle, Eastern on the right. And these are all little tiny brochures, like four pagers. And sometimes, again, they list all these cities, but they might not fly there. They might, you have to connect. Um, all through this era, they're flying really interesting aircraft. This early Boeing, the pilot sat here, outside. And the passengers were nice and comfy inside. There were other airliners like this. I said, well, you know, maybe that's the way why pilots make so much money these days, you know? <laughs> they they got to, but actually, they were getting incredibly low wages back in that era. Um, uh, there's another Lockheed Vega with that big killer engine on the front. And I think, I need to look it up, I think maybe the pilot is outside up there too because he sure ain't up here, you know, uh, with the passengers. Well, I'm not sure how warm. Maybe space heaters? Uh, who knows? Um, major breakthrough, Ford Trimotor. Reliable with three engines. Uh, and I'm pretty sure, you know, the Ford logo, I'm pretty sure that's actually Henry's handwriting. I think that's the legend anyway. That's how that logo came about. And there, you know, really, really wonderful airplane. That's what it looked like on the inside. So um, 
And, and, and when they, as airlines came in, you know, they weren't very safe. Uh, they weren't very comfortable. They were incredibly noisy. The planes weren't pressurized, so if you went high at all, the, your ears would pop all the time and get screwed up. And uh, no, it, it wasn't that great. But movie stars and wealthy people and business people in a hurry started going for it, you know? Um, all the, the major companies, I'm going to go through the history of some of the big companies, they all had roots from this era. There was a little guy called Robertson. It was the oldest of the companies that later became American. And Robertson, not American, was founded in 1926. The predecessor of TWA, one of them, was from 26. National Air Transport that became part of United, 1926. Northwest, one of the few that kept its name, 26. Pan Am kept its name, 27. Eastern Continental. Delta is the only one that's, that's now they're a little, little newer, 34. But Delta is the only one um, that has its original name. Or, or even close, but it's called Delta from that. Very, so you got these little guys, and they're all starting in the 20s. This is what changed everything. Who knows who he is? Charles Lindbergh. Yeah, Spirit of St. Louis. Was it Jimmy Stewart? Anyway, um, uh, didn't he make a movie about it? Uh, anyhow, uh, that 1927, that changed everything. All of a sudden, people's perception of air travel, people's perception of safety, confidence. He was this incredibly huge hero, and... It changed Wall Street's view. And as I looked, oh, 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 it changed kids' lives, too. This is, okay, a game, uh, uh, flying the beam, you know, because you had to follow a radio beam and spin the wheel. And in this one, I love this, is called airmail. And you do cards. I don't think they had crash cards, but they sure had ice on the wings, delay cards. And you try to get in this little plane from one city to another. That was a Parker Brothers game. Um, okay, so Wall Street does get into it. And, and big wheeler dealers. And it's interesting because when we talked about the movie industry last month, uh, the founders were a bunch of immigrant Jewish people from uh, Eastern Europe and Russia, and, and the Warner Brothers were from Poland and everything. And they were really outsiders. They were struggling to get in. It's a, I don't know if it's much of an oversimplification, but the bottom line, the airline industry is created by rich white people, rich white men. <laughs> you know, um, uh, Young guys went to Yale, Vanderbilt's, Morgans, Rockefellers went to Yale, went to Harvard, took you know flying classes. They were it's like fast cars, like Ferraris or whatever. It was cool, and I think that had a real impact on Wall Street's interest in the thing because Wall Street was still real scared in the movie business, and even though they knew this was all high risk and just starting out, so what you had is as different types of people, but really business people more than pilots or anything, put together big companies, and in late 1928. North American Aviation was formed by a guy named Clement Keyes, and he had been a journalist. He had been the writer about the airline industry, and he knew all the heads of the companies and said, oh, I can put something together here. Let's buy them out and buy them out. He knew Wall Street people because they read his magazine or what he wrote. And so a bunch of little airlines, Varney, Maddox, a, a, a little bigger one called Transcontinental Air Transport, um, which later became Transcontinental and Western Air, TWA, come back to them later included Eastern Air, and this thing became so big, General Motors at one point owned it. Because, yeah, we want to be in aviation. Um, but a lot of these people also owned manufacturing companies. So United Aircraft, Boeing Airplane, a Seattle company, was buying their engines from a Connecticut company, Pratt & Whitney, and they said, well, let's go together and form a big company, and they bought Sikorsky, Stearman, Chance Bought, which are aircraft makers and aircraft part ma parts makers, Hamilton Propeller, I didn't list all the things that went into these deals. But they also bought some airlines, the little ones, Pacific Air Transport, Stout Air Services, and a big one called National Air Transport. They actually had a big proxy fight with these people to get that one. And that all, they named it United Aircraft and Transport. And we'll come later to where they split the manufacturers from the airlines, but you've probably heard of United Technologies Company. Well, that used to be called United Aircraft, and they still make Pratt & Whitney engines in addition to Otis Elevators and a bunch of other stuff. And Boeing is still going, and United Airlines is still going. So three Fortune 500 companies came out of that one thing. Then, um, maybe the most powerful, Avco, Aviation Corporation. And that was put together by Wheeler Dealers. Uh, it actually, finally, in the 30s, was under the control of a guy named E.L. Cord, who was mainly an auto guy. He'd been an auto salesman, and he bought a company called Auburn Automobiles, and he created a car called the Cord. And if you're a car buff, you know all about him. And if you aren't a car buff, you've never heard of him. Anyway, he was, a, he was like a f flash. I mean, he was this incredibly famous big deal for three years. And then he disappeared into the Nevada desert. Didn't disappear. He became a state senator and took all his money with him. Um, 
Anyway, an interesting character. I have to do a separate talk about old Eret Loban Cord someday. Um, but they included Lycoming, which made, en made engines, Universal Aviation, the airline we saw a few minutes ago, uh, which itself was a combine of companies, Southern Air Transport, which was a combine of Tammany Golf down around New Orleans, and Texas Air Transport out of uh, uh, Fort Worth and Dallas. That all became American Airlines, but they had manufacturing as well. And then Curtis Wright was, um, the Wright brothers had left a company who, was, who were by then mainly making engines, and they merged with Curtis, who was an arch enemy. The Wrights and Curtis hated each other, but the Wrights had sold their company long before this, and I can't remember if Curtis was still in it now or not. I think he was out by then. But the two companies merged, and therefore they were making airplanes and engines, and they were the, they were the biggest defense contractor in World War II. And it's really interesting because they were out of business by like 1955. When everybody always talks about the military industrial complex and how war is good for business and everything, they, they were the biggest winner, if you want to call that, financially in World War II, and they were gone five years after. Because it's incredibly difficult for companies to convert from peacetime to war and back and forth. And that, that. But anyway, so you had these big companies formed, and so this all happened pretty fast, if you think about it. The airlines are started in 26, here they're all getting bought out and merged. At the same time, there are technological gains going on. So I talked about air and rail combination services. Boeing Airline, the airline, uh, had a 48-hour coast-to-coast service in July of 1927. Competitor in 29 came out with a 70-hour service. I presume they were bigger or nicer planes or something to, to be that much slower and still sell tickets. Universal came out with a 67-hour trip. Transcontinental Air Transport had a 40-hour trip in 29. And then they finally came out here on the bottom all air services, but you flew all day, you slept at night in, in a hotel, and you flew the next day. And so we got, we got her down to 36 hours here, transcontinental and western air, 1930. Now, big time, the, one of the most fascinating parts of studying the airline industry is the role of government in it, which continues, but it's, it's uh, followed some real interesting patterns. Um, oh, short version, uh, Walter Folger Brown, big Republican politician from Toledo, uh, like ran a machine there, I guess, whatever. I think he was a key player in getting Harding nominated. Uh, you may remember that was a real tough-fought uh, convention. Uh, he became a key um, campaign planner, a key figure in the Hoover campaign, uh, maybe Karl Rove or David Axelrod or whatever. His, his prize or whatever you want to say for being, doing all that was he was made postmaster. Well, the post office was the customer of the airlines. They were not flying many passengers. People didn't have that much guts. And this is, so in 1930, he's in charge, because he's the guy writing the checks. And whether they subsidize him, you know, give him way too much just to get an airline industry going, or whether they don't. So they're debating these issues. He basically takes charge, and he says, we need uh, to have a decent airline industry in America and to outdo the Europeans and everything. We need a, um, a handful of big, powerful, strong competitors. Because they've got to be able to service those airplanes. They've got to be safe. They got to be pros. They got to be well financed. That's one of the things. Maybe that's one reason it was rich white guys is because it took a lot of money to buy a lot of airplanes. Whereas you could shoot a movie pretty cheaply back in the 1920s, um, the movie industry talk. Um, and and so he had. They called him later the spoils conferences. He called all these guys in a room. Says, look, I want you to compete. I don't want there to be just one company, but I just want a handful of big companies. And I want transcontinental lines, but I want three of them. I want a northern line. I want a central line and a southern line. Now, they all started in New York, and they all ended in California, but you could go kind of the top way, the middle way, the bottom way. And, you know, these guys, they own these companies, and they're like, well, what if we don't want to? He says, well, you're not going to get any airmail contracts. You're out of business, you know? And the smaller companies, uh, a company like Delta and Braniff, we'll come back to some of them, they were just out of luck. They were out of the show. And in fact, even Transcontinental Air Transport, one of the big ones, he put a shotgun to their head and said, you've got to merge with Western Air Express. And that gave us a company called Transcontinental and Western Air. So he is essentially a dictator. And from what I can tell, and, and I do have to tell you, as much as I've read about the history of the airline industry, most all the people that write about it are people who love airplanes, which I also do, but they don't have much business sense. <laughs> and, and so sometimes I see the judgments and things they write, and I'm not sold on it, you know? So I'm still learning about all this. Because they'll talk about one of the guys from the last slide, the Wheeler Dealer, say, oh, he did this brilliant proxy battle. And then I realize the guy writing the book doesn't even really know what a proxy battle is and what even might be a brilliant proxy battle if such a thing ever existed, you know? So uh, anyway, so I say some of this with some trepidation, but the buzz I get is everybody hated this guy. 
The airlines hated this guy. The politicians hated this guy. I guess Hoover loved him. Anyhow, uh, and, and, but, but there's, a, there's a recent book, this one, by a guy at Smithsonian that kind of clears the guy's reputation. It says, oh, we wouldn't have a great airline industry without this guy. I'm not sure if I believe that either, but so 1930 makes that happen, makes these guys merge, does all this stuff. And things are, and we are, there's no question. The airline industry is getting bigger and better run and safer and all that. Next guy in the job. Well, first, Hugo Black, senator from Alabama, Democrat. FDR's in, Hoover's out. All the Hoover's guys are mud, you know, their name's mud. This guy, who was a, a key guy in the Roosevelt campaign, becomes postmaster. Hugo Black has a bunch of congressional hearings and, uh, and, and working with Farley, post office guy, and says the spoils conferences and everything that Brown did was illegal, illicit, immoral, evil, you know, uh, it was a bunch of guys in a room and a closed door. It, they screwed over the uh, Braniff and Delta and all these fine independent business people and they fought on behalf of the giant companies and so that's over with. And they canceled all the airmail contracts. We're now up 1933, 1934, so only three or four years later, canceled all the airmail contracts, gave the job to the, to the Air Force, to the uh, Army, to the military flyers, who oh, there's something like, I should double check the figure, but something like half of all their flights crashed. They, the, the guys who are flying for the airlines do a lot more about how to deal with the Rockies and how to deal with these crazy airports. The military people, you know, they've been out of the military business since like 1918, and it was a disaster. The mail didn't get through and everything. So it was, a, and, and of course the whole thing was positioned as, oh, the evil Republicans, the last administration, we're going to fix it. And then it was a huge black eye for Farley and FDR and everything. So, but they still, you know, kind of in a fix there, had to do something. And um, so what they did is said, uh, okay, we're going to start over. We're going to go back to the airlines. And it's only a couple or three months because the whole thing exploded in their face. And they went back and they said, okay, you can get an airmail contract, but first of all, you can't have been at one of those spoils conferences. So essentially, all the heads of all the airlines weren't allowed back in the business. Well, luckily, they had a lot of good lieutenants who we're going to see in a minute are the people who built the industry. But they weren't allowed back in, the head of United, all these, the, the presidents were out. And then the other thing they said is, if, you, if your company had an airmail contract, you can't bid on the new ones. All the, I still need to, I need to go into some like legal history textbooks and see the exact details, but basically all the airlines changed a few letters in their names and got the new contracts. <laughs> you, know, you know, airlines with a space between them. And then, you know, United Airlines, it's three words. United Airlines, it's two words. No, it was. Uh, American Airways became American Airlines. They did, and it was all the same people except for the head person. So it's just bizarre, <laughs> you know? All, all the way around kind of bizarre. And they all got their old routes back. They did give a few boosts to the Braniffs and Deltas and some of these kind of outsiders, but they were so far behind in building the system, they were still not major players at that point. So it's, it's just fascinating. And then and in 1938, they create the Civil Aeronautics Board, and from 1938 until Jimmy Carter and his people deregulated the airlines in 1978, for 40 years, every route decision, every merger, and every pricing decision in the airline industry had to be approved by the CAB in Washington. And then all of a sudden, in 1978, that disappeared. And, and, and you know, we're talking business lessons and stuff. I got this book, it just came out. It's by two Harvard Business School professors and another person. One of the Harvard Business School professors is a chair of their leadership initiative. And the whole book is uh, what the airline industry can teach us about leadership. And, and I, I actually am kind of, I don't know what to say about it. The book has good stories in it. it tells us some of the same stories I'm telling tonight about some of these people. But their fundamental conclusions are, they're nonsense, <laughs> you know, I don't, it sounds really weird. That's the way I felt when I got it, I can't wait to read this. And, it, and it's, well, for starters, the basic premise of the book is that we can learn this huge amount from all these people that built the airline industry. The only people that might learn anything about them would be somebody else whose all the key decisions are made in Washington. So maybe a utility <laughs> or a bank, but even then, nothing was as bizarre as this. The trucking industry was, it was deregulated too, but it's just a very strange, and when you go into the book and look at how they describe it, it's. Um, they're right to really uh, learn a lot from Herb Kelleher, but Herb Kelleher, Herb Kelleher would have been a winner in any in industry, you know? So um, anyhow, anyhow. Um, so this, I'm not going to show you too many words and numbers. Uh, chart, uh, that's uh, total passenger miles. That's how you measure the size of an airline. That's United Airlines. They got way ahead of everybody because they had a big coast-to-coast -coast system. 
and, uh, and this is early, this is the brown era here. And then 34, it's when it kicked in when they made the, whatever changes they made, which actually helped United's competitors. American was second biggest, TWA, Pan Am, and Eastern. And th out of this era came the terminology, just like we had a big three auto industry, the big four airlines. And what that meant was United, American, TWA, and Eastern, because they were all domestic carriers. None of them had hardly any business outside the United States. Pan Am was not considered one of the big four. It was on its own trip outside the U.S. Going to run through the airlines now, briefly. The airline that became United, we know today. The guy who ran it, built it, um, a guy named William A. Pat Patterson. Uh, he grew up on, uh, on Hawaii where his dad ran a plantation, but his dad beat the Japanese workers and the plantation company fired him and, and, or moved him to Puerto Rico as punishment. <laughs> who knows about all these stories? And, and, uh, and where dad got malaria and died. <laughs> and, and, so, uh, and so then they're broke, so mom goes to San Francisco to get a job. She leaves him in school in Hawaii. And he runs away and gets on a boat and goes to San Francisco where mom spanks him hard and puts him back on a boat to Hawaii where he runs away again, goes to California. She gives up. He's 14 years old. He gets a job as like an assistant clerk at Wells Fargo Bank. He becomes a banker. He, uh, a guy comes in and says, I got air. This is in the early airplane stage, the 20s, late 20s. I got this airplane. And oh, I know what it was. Is he found an engine, an airplane that crashed into San Francisco Bay or whatever. He said, but the engine's still good. I can go pull it up. And it only cost me 200 bucks to pull up that airplane. It'd be worth 800 bucks I get it out of there. Will you loan me the money? And old Patterson said, oh, I don't think so. <laughs> you know, I mean, why do you know about air engines have been underwater for six months or whatever? Anyhow, but he got interest in the industry. Next thing we know, he is an assistant to an assistant inside of this booming Boeing United system that I mentioned. The Boeing system, which was an airline as well as an airplane maker. The big one they bought, uh, uh, National Air Transport, its main line was Chicago to New York. Big airmail, they had the airmail contract, it was a big deal. Uh, so Boeing, and they renamed the whole thing, they put all the different ones they bought, National, Boeing, and there were others, and knitted them together to create this one called United. And by the time we're here, in the 30s, Mr. Patterson is the CEO. Uh, gosh, a couple of little things on Patterson. He, um, he invented the stewardess. Uh, they were talking about having men uh, be on the planes. Usually it was a co-pilot that poured coffee and got you to calm down and not freak out. And, and, uh, and then uh, a nurse came and said, well, why don't you hire nurses? I got a bunch of buddies that go to work for you. It's the 30s and everything. And, and they fought over it. Actually, everybody in the company turned it down and got to Patterson's desk. He said, let's do it. So they created the flight attendant. Uh, uh, the first system, and they were all nurses. Uh, you can see, it's basically a single line across the country. These are little branches or connecting airlines. Uh, they were owned by Boeing in the early days, so they had to use Boeing aircraft. Um, oh, I forgot to mention that when um, FDR's guy, Farley, when he redid all that deal, he made all the manufacturers separate themselves from the airlines. So Boeing and Pratt & Whitney were no longer related to United Airlines and all that. They broke off. And you know, the line is, well, if, they, if, if the manufacturer owns the airline, then that airline's going to get the first dibs on the best planes, and the little airlines can never get a good plane and everything. Well, the truth is, they flew, this was the first steel airliner, this early Boeing, but it was not a good plane. It, I think it had more economic and inefficiency and repair issues. I don't think it was a safety issue. And old Patterson always said, man, was he glad he, he wasn't related to Boeing anymore, because as soon as he could get rid of those planes, he moved to an independent manufacturer, a company called Douglas. Uh, but that was the first steel plane. And um, again, their route, straight line. And that was the northern transcontinental route. Over time, they added branches, go to the government, get approval, add little branches, spread out. They were friendly, happy to see you. DC-3, their logo evolved. One of the things, too, through all this stuff, one reason I show so many pictures is because I think commercial art and how it reflects the times is, is fascinating and often quite beautiful. Uh, 1961, they bought one of the secondary carriers, which nobody remembers anymore, a company called Capital Airlines. It really started as like a Pittsburgh to Washington carrier, and over the years, it, by 61, it had gotten this big. It had gotten rights from the CAB to go south. And so when United bought that, that gave them an east, you know, east side in. Very important markets, New York to Florida and all that. So by the 60s, United was zipping around, and the lines are longer because we got jets by then. Next company, American Airlines. Guy who built it, a guy named C.R. Smith. C.R. Smith, his daddy died when he was, I think, seven. His mom, six or seven kids. C.R. was the oldest one, Minerva, Texas. Uh, C.R. was a hard-working guy, and he got into a business school at a place called the University of Texas. 
was an undergraduate, studied accounting. While he was an undergraduate, he's going down to the courthouse or city hall or whatever and getting records of all the weddings. And then he's compiling a list of everybody's getting married, and he's selling the list to people that publish brides magazines or baby carriage makers and stuff. So he was a mail list uh, you know, operator as an undergraduate. I think he may have still been in college when he got a part-time job at Pete Marwick, which now became the company KPMG, the big accounting firm. Anyway, before we know it, he's hired uh, by a utility up in Dallas and Fort Worth and, um, to be their assistant controller or whatever. And the guy owns the utility, makes an investment in a little thing called Texas Air Transport, which is one of the things that gets sucked up into one of these, the Avco empire. Well, when everybody gets kicked out of the spoils conference and everything, Smith ends up in charge. Smith, um, he, they were headquartered in Chicago, and then Fiorello LaGuardia wanted to build a new airport in New York City, because you had to go to Newark to fly out of New York. So LaGuardia built a new airport out in Queens, and Smith said, oh, if we move our headquarters to New York, we'll get a sweet deal, right? And we'll get the best hangers and, and have an edge on getting that important New York traffic. So he moved to New York, and then LaGuardia personally had a VIP suite at, the, um, at that new airport, in LaGuardia in Queens. And he said, um, and in some speech, old Little Flower, you know, Fiorella, he said, uh, oh, I want to, this thing to be such a success, I'll rent out my VIP suite. And C.R. Smith rented it out, and he named it the Admiral's Club. And, and, and it was related to the fact their planes were called flagships, you know? So uh, the logo evolved. Now, this is great because it's one of the few logos that stayed a lot the same. I mean, that, those bird wings, they're still there, you know? Um, there's a Stinson. Is that a beauty? And see, this is old airplane lovers that have restored that baby. Uh, a Douglas Sleeper Transport, DST. It's just like a Pullman train. The nurse came through, pulled the curtains. She slept in berths. Uh, their system, they were the Southern Transcontinental. Shows how bad the geography is in Congress. I don't know. <laughs> and whoop, came across Buffalo and Cleveland and dipped. They called it the Southern because it was kind of down here. But the reason it was such a mess was they had cobbled together these little companies. And they, and they didn't all make sense, you know. They just, they bought this and they bought that. And, and the Texas Air Transport was the one that was down here where C.R. Smith worked. Uh, they finally, by the late 30s, they kind of rationalized it. And they really did have kind of a Southern route. They're Washington and Nashville. They were happy. They were friendly, too. Uh, moving ahead into the uh, 50s. Uh, I, I threw a few in luggage tags. Man, in the old days, they'd put uh, hotels and airlines would put tags, stickers on your luggage so you know where you've been. My dad's case was just covered. Man, I wish I still had that. All the old airline things. DC-3, we'll come back to it. Beautiful airplane again, one that's been restored by airplane lovers. And these are just some postcards and shots of American in those 30s, those glory days, including getting down uh, to Mexico, uh, planning the trip, of course, you know, the whole crew there is looking at the weather map and you know, about to get hit in the head by that giant tail. <laughs> our, our boys in the service and our well-dressed, you know, passengers. Oh, the buzz at Love Field in Dallas, the intensity of it all. A plane coming and going every 45 minutes. Anyway, uh, the inside, the DC-7. Uh, that's, we'll come, I'm going to come back and talk a little about aircraft. But that's the inside in the glory days of the, before the jets. And their route system over time, you know. And the, and the government wanted to keep them competing with each other, so all the big guys got these transcontinental routes. And you can see them there, because that's their nonstops. They were so proud of this was soon after jets came into use. TWA, another one, the third one of the, of the big four. Um, Jack Fry was a pilot. TWA was really the creation of big corporate interests kind of thing. Uh, there were, uh, and, and Fry worked for him, but he ran it. He was a really, he was a great pilot and everything. He had a friend. Anybody know who that is? Howard Hughes, his buddy. He got Hughes to invest in the company because uh, he thought Hughes would be good for it. Hughes was also a pilot, and Hughes and Fry set a transcontinental speed record in the Lockheed Constellation. I think it was like eight hours or something. And of course, you always had, you had a third person on the plane, but you know, you had a flight engineer in the old days. So, um, and then, and then, and then, Fry never got along with Hughes, one of his right-hand guys. I think it was Noah Dietrich, uh, and he got run out. But he was there ten or eleven years. Yeah, post Howard after he died, Time Magazine's version. Of course, if you've seen the movie The Aviator, you know, you know the story. I think they did a pretty good job of telling the story overall, for a movie, you know. Um, this, here it started, transcontinental air transport, coast to coast by plane and train. 
you know, using both. Um, here it is, and there's their route. You can see it's a railroad to Columbus, airplane out here to Oklahoma, railroad overnight, and airplane the rest of the way in on the West Coast. And that was TAT. So they were a big, they were a big force. And then when uh, Brown forced them to merge with Western Air Express, it became transcontinental and Western Air. Across the continent in 36 hours. Amazing. And, and there's their route. And it was a Lindbergh line. Lindbergh worked for several airlines. Uh, I think he was chief technical advisor for these guys. But his, his name shows up a lot. Um, you know, look. I mean, and, and also remember that all these planes are flying below the weather. They weren't pressurized. So when you flew, you could look down and see the farmers and everything and everything that was going on. So even their route maps, the ones that handed out on a plane, would be the um, uh, pictures of what kind of fields and factories so you'd know where you were at. There's your nice TWA early plane. Again, the whole tradition of having beautiful graphics or intriguing graphics, uh, really if you study the, uh, the, the bus companies, the railroad companies, and the steamship lines, it was a long history and tradition of you know, catching people's eye. The Europeans did amazing posters for their railroads and stuff. DC-3. Uh, very few of these flew. The, uh, that was a Boeing Stratoliner. It was based on a, a bomber. But it's a pretty cool airplane, and here's the inside of it. So obviously they got like sleepers and then an, an open row, you know. Although I didn't bring tonight the whole history of coach travel and all that, but coach was an innovation that the airlines tried to get in and the CAB wouldn't let them do it. They wouldn't let them get discount. It got real complex. And then when they did start getting it, coach flights and first class flights were separate planes. You were never on the same plane together. Yeah, because the they used the old beater planes that were fully depreciated for coach. You know, and first class were their new planes. Now, I'm, I'm not sure who changed all that. Friendly, happy? Uh, TWA, it was the middle transcontinental route. It was really a little blurred here because they wanted Chicago traffic, but the core of that system was New York, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, Columbus, Ohio, Indianapolis, St. Louis, Kansas City, Amarillo West. And uh, I think it was Carol Lombard, the actress, who died in a, a TWA uh, airplane that crashed over the Grand Canyon. It was a huge national tragedy thing. Uh, but that was their core line. That's why my dad was on TWA all the time. That's the way you got to California and New York from Indianapolis. Then, after the war, we're going to talk in a minute about a company called Pan Am that wanted to have all of the outside, uh, foreign routes in the world for a U.S. airline. But after the war, the government said, ah, oh, you need some competition. Let these guys in. TWA was the main one they let in. And by 48, what is 46, they were going into Paris. And shortly thereafter, Palestine and Bombay. Bombay, India. Um, here they are at the Paris airport, one of their lovely constellations that Howard Hughes was behind and brought to the airline. Beautiful aircraft, the inside of it. Uh, their system, uh, uh, it got more complex, more U.S. routes, but the big deal was this big all the way over here to um, Asia. Uh, here by the 60s. See, that's the U.S. in red, and then Asia got all the way to Hong Kong. So you could fly it. So that was a big deal. Um, and and uh, it's interesting because it has, they didn't own them, but they connected with a helicopter airline in San Francisco and one in New York. There was a third one in Chicago. And they, the New York one went from LaGuardia to Wall Street to Newark to Kennedy Airport, and they went all over the Bay Area, including Sunnyvale and Marin County. And uh, for uh, 10 years or so, there, those helicopter airlines were, were working. You know, I was never sure why they completely went away. Uh, there, I guess there is one in New York again now. Then the last of the big four, one that's less relevant for us down here, but it was still a player. Eastern Airlines, the key guy there, a guy named Eddie Rickenbacker, famous air ace. Um, uh, yeah, an amazing guy, amazing guy. Uh, had a share of controversy and everything. Started as a smaller airline. Well, what they became is the East Coast, up and down the East Coast. New York to Miami with a stop in Atlanta. New York to Miami traffic was where the action was. Uh, I love this. This is during World War II. This is no time to waste time, Eddie Rickenbacker, because he was a national, you know, he was a war hero. It was a big deal. He was also extremely conservative, and at times that hurt Eastern Airlines. But, you know, here is a bunch of, whether they're businessmen or generals or what, but they're Eastern Airlines. Uh, they had the great silver fleet for the airplanes. There is one of them. That really just looks like right out of Johnny Rocket or something, huh? Uh, I always viewed them as kind of the, oh, the white color East Coast Airline because their blue pinstripes, their headquarters was in a building in Rockefeller Center, the Eastern Airlines building. And, uh, and, and they got, like the others, by the 60s, they covered more routes. They got some international. They got San Juan. They got Mexico City. I'm sure they would have loved to have Havana if it had been open. 
So here we come up, uh, coming up to World War II, American had become the biggest under C.R. Smith. I mean, he really, from a, a business viewpoint, he, really, he ran an amazing outfit, but so did Patterson. Um, TWA was a rougher story, with Hughes in and out and issues. Um, Eastern was about the same size as TWA. Uh, it was a rougher story, and then Pan Am was on a trip of its own. I'll come to it. This is a plane that changed everything. That's a Douglas DC-3. 1942, right when we went into the war, there were 322 airliners in the U.S. airline system. 260 of them were Douglas DC-3s. Lockheed total 29, Boeing total 25. They owned the industry. It, that plane was over-engineered. The airlines, I think it was mainly American, although they kind of fight over this. They went to Douglas and said, we got to have a plane that we can fly at night over the Rockies. You know? And, and it still wasn't pressurized, though, but, you know, that'll make it. And so they didn't know what it would take to make it, so they made it ten times as strong as it needed to be. And there's, there were thousands of them made, thousands of them used in World War II, and there are some of them still flying around the world. There's Donald Douglas, Douglas in uh, Santa Monica, California. And that's it. And they called it a tail dragger because the tail was down. That's the cockpit. Inside. Always friendly, happy, nice, good food. Uh, uh, Oshkosh, the big air show they have up in Wisconsin. There's one that some people have restored, a beauty. And this is one they restored at the C.R. Smith Museum near DFW Airport, the, the American Airlines people, um, retired people and stuff. I don't think it's owned by the company. It's a beautiful aircraft. Now, I urge you to go up to that museum. It's a great place. Okay, Pan Am. Pan Am, Juan Trip. If you saw the movie The Aviator, uh, it was played by Alec Baldwin. And they gave him kind of a bad look in The Aviator, not way far off, but but he really was an entrepreneur. He was, among all these people, he was the one who in college said, I want to start an airline, and I'm going to change the world, and I'm going to do whatever it takes. And he used to plan his routes by stretching a string on his big globe. He was friends with uh, Lindbergh. In fact, I didn't get a chance to scan it in. This, I bought this on eBay. It's a picture of Lindbergh about to leave Miami for the first airmail operation from Miami to the uh, Panama Canal. And he's doing it for Pan American Airlines. I bought on eBay, and it's, it's like stamped. It's from the Pan American Public Relations Division, Miami, Florida. It's like a new picture from whatever that would have been, 1931 or something. Um, again, flying boats. They're safer. They're cool. <laughs> Everybody likes flying boats, you know. And so Pan Am was mainly a flying boat company. And you boarded that way. And then their route, see, they, they weren't allowed to fly in the U.S. because they wanted, and Tripp's whole thing was he wanted to be the chosen instrument. That was the word. The chosen instrument of the U.S. government to take on all the world's airlines outside the U.S. And the U.S. carriers really didn't want to go overseas very bad. Even, I think it was a United, Patterson did a study and said, no, we shouldn't even go overseas. There's not enough business. And to keep in mind that all the foreign carriers, I think every single one of the major ones, was owned by the government of those companies, countries. So... To have us for have a separate, independent, for-profit, publicly held airline fight and the government-owned ones, everybody said, well, if they're going to have to do that, then let them have that whole thing to themselves. But what they did, they flew from Miami down to South America, and they flew from Brownsville, and they came down out of L.A., but they couldn't fly between two U.S. cities. And they, they focused on the Caribbean at first. Here's their uh, Miami. Imagine going to the airport like that. Here you are taking off from Miami. And then they worked their way all the way around the coast, you know, port to port. And it went, one plane went one way and one plane went the other way. So, you know, but this is old Juan Trip and the, nice graphics. And then the big deal, San Francisco Bay, because they opened to China. And when he did this, he flew to Hawaii and, and the plane, I didn't mention, the planes can't make it long distances. That's why there were no transcontinental overnight flights. The planes couldn't haul the fuel. They, couldn't, they just couldn't, you know, make that distance. And when you're going west, you're into a headwind. So even when they started transatlantic, they went east okay, but coming west, they had to stop in Ireland and Newfoundland and stuff. So, so he went, and he went to Midway, Wake, Guam, and Manila, and in each Midway, Wake, and Guam, he built an airfield, and he built a hotel. And Pan Am pioneered the whole thing, basically just built their way across the Pacific. Overnight to Hawaii, $278. Coming in from the Orient over San Francisco Bay. Sleepers, of course. Landing in the Far East. Hong Kong, right? With no skyscraper. And, and then by the 60s, he girdled the globe. He went everywhere. He also was always the first guy to introduce the big new aircraft. 
and some people blame the end of Pan Am, its collapse later after he'd retired because he'd always spent too much and everything. I, it's hard to say. I mean, they say, oh, he, he had a big vision, but he didn't know when to stop and everything. I don't, I don't know. This industry had a fair number of people who didn't have a very big vision. So it's, he's an interesting guy to study. And this is, as a timetable collector, maybe my all-time favorite, this is around the world service. And it'd leave from New York and end in L.A. Couldn't fly across the U.S. I, they probably flew him empty across. But, and you could, you could book it. You could fly all the way around. Get off where you wanted to. Here's all these guys I'm talking about. I haven't talked about Delta and Continental and some of those yet because they're secondary. I'm going to talk about them in a minute. The big four, Pan Am, Juan Terry Tripp ran that company for 41 years. Woman at Delta, we'll come to him in a minute, 38 years. C.R. Smith, 35 years. He left and they had to bring him back to try to save the company at one point or fix it up. Patterson, 29 years. Rickenbacker, 19. Bryant TWA was only 13 because of the Hughes thing. And we'll come to Robert Six at Continental more than anybody else, 42 years. So when you think about an industry where all the key competitors were uh, stable, where you know they knew the same people for the shortest 13 years, but all the, all the key players really, 29 was the shortest of the giants, right? So when they talk to Washington and say, what are you doing or what should we do? Or they, it's really amazing because you think about today in any industry for the CEO of a company to have a competing CEO be the same man or woman for three years is probably an incredibly long time. You know, even if you're in for 10, they're in for 10, you won't overlap that. These people all came in at the same time, ran that sucker. And at the same time, they were not set in prices, they were not set in routes, they had very little control over the most important decisions in their company. Tricky thing. I, this is about U.S. Airlines tonight. I'm going to touch on these because they're so um, interesting and romantic. KLM is the oldest of the big international carriers in 1919. was run by the same guy until the early 50s. And in fact, he, he was in uh, Hitler's prisons in Holland during World War II. And the airline kept flying without him. It started out, you know, little routes, London to Rotterdam and Amsterdam. And then it got big. It got up to Sweden, Paris. And then it got real big. All the European carriers were trying to get to their colonies. Batavia, Java, which today we would call Jakarta, Indonesia. And there it is. It was 9,000 miles in nine days. And it, and it had like two seats, and if they had too much mail, you'd get bumped. And the mail would go through, and you would have to spend the week or two, weekly service, the week in, you know, Basra or whatever, until the next plane came through. It would have been an interesting time to be a global traveler, huh? Ah, they had some nice airplanes, though. Deutsch, Deutsche Lufthansa, three words. I think it says German Airline, <laughs> you know, a German Flying Company, something like that, right? The, the crane, which they still use in their advertising, came in very early, 27, and, and, and they were the biggest, most powerful of the European air carriers. Their timetable, instead of our kind, they made a map with the cities and they put the times on there and showed when it landed. Now, it got kind of tough when they had a lot of cities on the map. The Swedes did the same thing. Unfortunately, the German airline came under bad administration, <laughs> bad management. And, um, and as punishment after World War II, the Allies shut them down. And Lufthansa did not get cranked back up until like the mid-50s. You know, Air France, the British and the French got a jump on them. Today, they are one of the great giant airlines again. Uh, the French, parallel to the Americans, a bunch of little airlines, but you know, Europeans maybe even better graphics than the Americans. Farman was a guy, uh, French airline, the reason it's in English is because they were all trying to get British customers and everything. Air Union, nice graphics, another small French carrier. Aeropostal, uh, Le Leslie Wexner, the guy that created um, the Limited and all that. He stole that name, I'm pretty sure it was him, but stole that name for a chain of clothing stores. Anyway, but it's interesting, here we are, 1928, they're flying France, uh, uh, Spain, Morocco, Algeria, Western Africa, uh, so South America. And the shortest way across the Atlantic is from basically Senegal, you know, Dakar, whatever, to Bilem, uh, Brazil, if you look at a map of the world. And I believe, if you study the airline maps, you see it over and over, because they couldn't cross the North Atlantic. They could cross that. And early on, the French, the Germans were going down there. The Germans built a lot of airlines in South America, and all the stories about the Nazis ending up in Argentina and all that, it's, um, I think that was a key part of it. The airlines were already going there. Here's Air France, flying around uh, France, but also trying to get over here to to the Far East, it says, because they're, uh, oh, they had the weirdest looking planes. All kinds of, and look at all the, see when these giant international airlines had to have offices in all these cities and agents and how expensive it was to maintain all that. So 
some beautiful aircraft. So here we are, Air France route map 1936. Big European network, but see, they drop down and they cross the, cross the Atlantic down there and go all the way down to Buenos Aires and then across to Santiago. And then they're going over here to Saigon because that's their Asian colony. So they hop all the way across. This is what Air France became by the 60s, giant globe girdling. But this is only their big routes, their major routes. They had little tiny routes all through there. So West Africa in the French colonies, they covered uh, Madagascar and they covered into China in the subsidiary lines. They were the world's biggest airline in terms of the miles of routes at their peak. Uh, Imperial Airways was the British, very imperial. Um, little line, London to Paris and Switzerland. Then they branched out, Egypt, Iraq, India, Kenya, Africa. Cool airplanes, really cool airplanes. Um, and then they, uh, they went from Southampton to Sydney. They went all the way to Australia. But again, this is an imperial flying boat. So it's hopping along the ports, right? And then later, 40s or 50s, I guess they changed it from Imperial Airways to British Overseas Aviation Corporation, Airways Corporation, BOAC is what the travel agents called it. And again, giant all the way around the globe, giant British operation. And, and that didn't become British Airways till much later. Then uh, every, all the other countries had to have an airline. Sabina was the Belgian one. They had some of the best art. Again, a hub at Brussels, and everything reaches out from there. Um, some pretty wild art. The Congo, maybe the worst case in history of colonialism. I guess that's, that's saying, <laughs> saying a lot. Uh, but, um, but they were trying to get people to go vacation there. Uh, the Swedes had AB Aero Transport, later became part of SAS. All the Scandinavian countries merged their airlines and created one big one, SAS. The Italians, they uh, later rolled them up into Alitalia. Oh, I just had to show this. This is a little Philippine airline. And, and, but again, the route map, this is what you would have had in a plane with it, shows the plantations and what's grown because you could recognize it at the low altitude. Air India, uh, built by the Tata family, the famous Indian industrialist. But the government took it away from him, but still he had stayed chairman. I think he was pretty upset about that for a long time. But uh, beautiful maps. Uh, their route, you know, with, and this is later. And again, they didn't bother crossing the Atlantic. They were based in India, so they got down to Australia and up to Europe. I just put this up here to remind me. World War II, of course, the industry came to a halt, basically. The pilots uh, went and worked for the military. And like flying the hump, if you've ever heard about that, from Burma over to uh, China, uh, amazing. Every two minutes, a plane would leave, 1,500 tons a day. Uh, again, the same guys leading it, American and United. No big change there. Look through these pretty quick. Uh, Delta was a crop duster. See the crop duster? He was a crop duster, C.E. Woolman. He couldn't get into the big group. He wasn't in the spoils conference. Uh, his line really, he was based in Monroe, Louisiana, and he ran from Dallas to Atlanta, and then they got an extension to Charleston. So it was an east-west route across the south. Probably nobody flying it. <laughs> but he was in the south, so he was ahead of the curve. And gradually, the CAB seemed to me to have a tendency to give the medium-sized companies more new routes. And he got rights to Chicago, and he, got, he was already over at Dallas. That's a through line, an interchange service. It, it's no longer happened. Around 1950, to be able to get more mileage, they would do a deal with another airline, and they would share planes. So that might be Continental or Western Airlines. And they would, you could get on the plane here and fly all the way through those. They'd share the engines, share the, share the machines. Um, a, a smaller company, Chicago and Southern, was basically the uh, Chicago to New Orleans line. And the branches were given at Houston to De Detroit. Delta bought them in 53 or 54, and that propelled Delta to a higher status. And Delta CNS, Delta Chicago and Southern, they briefly called the airline that. Um, flying in over Miami, you know, important point for them, inside the airplane. And now, then they got New York entry and they got West Coast. So, um, Northwest, some of the best graphics. It was basically Chicago to Minneapolis, and then got branches west. I love this pilot working away. Uh, oh, Boeing Stratocruiser, the first double-deck airplane based on a bomber. That's the downstairs lounge, smoking away. Uh, and then they got, th this is an interchange. They didn't really fly to Miami. But they got entry into New York, and then when the government after the war began to open up the world, they let them go over to Tokyo. So Northwest has been flying to Asia for a long time. And when I studied the industry, I was like, how amazing is Northwest? Because the winners they had to deal with and everything. Braniff, Paul Braniff was a pilot. He was an outsider. He was one of the ones that didn't get in the spoils conference and everything. 
His brother, Tom, was really the businessman, had already built a big uh, insurance agency in Oklahoma where they lived, started this airline in Texas. Uh, it's around Chicago, Kansas City, Tulsa, Oklahoma City, Wichita Falls. They, they weren't into Texas yet. Uh, I think they'd say the world's fastest airline because they bought these fast little guys. And then here, you know, it almost reminds me of that railroad ad about business dreams in Texas because it's, you know, 70 league boots, stuff and across. And they stopped in Austin. And as of 1980, the only carriers coming to Austin were Braniff, Continental, and Trans-Texas. American and all those people didn't come into this town until late 80, early 81. American had been here in the 30s but dropped out for 50 years. It's too small a town. One thing, oh, on that map, they go to Brownsville, bottom line. Why is that important? That's where you pick up Pan Am to fly to Latin America at the Brownsville Airport. Uh, Braniff, good graphics. Nice planes. That's at the Fort Worth Airport. In Fort Worth, you know, used to have big airline, airplane, airports that competed with Dallas. And then the government let them go overseas and they gave them the west coast of Latin America. And it became, uh, it became Braniff International Airlines. <laughs> yeah, is that politically sensitive or what? Con going to Latin America and calling it the Conquistador? Um, but they were pretty airplanes. And they got into New York and here they are, you know, must have been in the 50s on Times Square at the big sign. Uh, more luggage sticker, brand opening the beautiful new Love Field Terminal, fall of 57. And, you know, they got big and got more and more routes in the U.S. Now this guy, sorry for the awful picture, I think he was kind of a handsome guy. And it doesn't look like his name's Harding Lawrence. Also went to a business school at the University of Texas at Austin. Uh, he was a marketing guy, working for Little Airline, got bought by Continental. Braniff hired him away from Continental in 1965. He became the CEO of Braniff. He said, we're going to do things different. He hired Alexander Calder, the artist, to repaint the plane. They got all colorful, like here at the beautiful Austin airport. Uh, things got kind of wacky in the cabin. I have no idea what's going on here. And 15 years, Braniff, he bankrupted it, basically. Overexpanded, took it overseas, uh, just too big for their riches. Continental Airlines, uh, the last one in the story here. Uh, Robert Six, uh, he was a real entrepreneur. He bought a little airline called Varney that flew from Pueblo to Las Vegas, not the right Las Vegas, to Santa Fe, down to El Paso. And, um, and Morg he and his partner mortgaged their houses to buy three Lockheed airplanes. He renamed it Continental. He extended the line to Denver, getting to the big city. Went with his western motif. That's one of my favorite images. And really built this kind of, just the blue was his airline. Built this intense cluster based around New Mexico, which doesn't seem to make much sense, but that's where he started. And, uh, and he had through routes so he could ship people to California working with other airlines. Nice in the lounge on your DC-7. And then he got big, he got rights going to Chicago and LA and popped out and uh, went through a couple different logos. This is a favorite of mine too. I found this postcard. And, and uh, I don't know if you remember the SST, it was made in Europe. Uh, Boeing was gonna do one. And they had signed up and said, oh, we're gonna have them. So they were giving postcards out about, why do you ride your Continental Supersonic? That'd be fun to ride from Austin to Dallas, or da Austin to Houston, right? Doop, doop. Be one of those weightless flights. Okay, uh, local service carriers. Uh, there were 13 little airlines created after, during and after World War II um, all around the U.S. Each covered a little region of the U.S. They're called local service carriers. They were subsidized by the government to try to get to small air service to small towns. All American became Allegheny. Robinson became Mohawk. North Central became Republic. Piedmont, I think, went into Republic later. Central, I uh, forget what, they went into Frontier, I think. Frontier was another one. Ozark was another one. A bunch of these little guys, the one relevant to us here is Trans-Texas, which uh, actually in the early days didn't even go to Austin, went all the way around Austin. Maybe they were afraid of us. But then later, Austin became a major center for them and remained so until it was bought by Frank Lorenzo, a crazy guy who had also bought Continental and People Express and Eastern and bankrupted all of them, all of them, <laughs> and was banned from the industry. The government threw him out. He cannot work in the airline industry. Um, and this they were celebrating, the merger of Continental and Trans-Texas had been renamed Texas International. And the, and the CFO, a controller or whatever, of Trans-Texas was a guy named Bill Mackey. And he was later an accounting professor at Rice University. He has a son named John Mackey who came here and started a crazy health food store. Um, we, as we move past World War II, we move into more advanced aircraft. The DC-3 had been the workhorse. The DC-4, a four-engine plane but not pressurized. Your ear still popped and still couldn't go up above like 16,000 feet. 
You go up above that's where you get above the clouds and can fly smoothly. Then they came up with a pressurized DC-6, really in response to competition from the Lockheed Constellation, inside of a DC-6. That uh, might be a Delta one. There's the Delta. That's a DC-7. That's the next one up. Uh, this is that they, they, you can create uh, their game players, like uh, uh, fantasy football. They have fantasy airlines, and that was on the web. Uh, they were advertised them, of course. They're beautiful new DC-7. Oh, that was a cutaway, how complex they were. Because these, these are like, whatever, 16-cylinder engines, each one of them, 3,500 horsepower. The competition that made them all rock and roll was the Constellation. Pressurized, faster, smoother, better in every way. And this was Howard Hughes and Lockheed, their project. And there it is on TWA flying over Manhattan. You can see the beautiful curves of it. And it was just uh, still my, my favorite airplane. And there are maybe three of them in the world still flying. One's been restored up in Kansas City. There's the cockpit. There it is over New York again. Uh, I won't go. Uh, uh, send me an email. I'll send you the whole slides if you want to see. But basically, our, our speed on those planes we just saw, they went from 180 miles an hour up to about 360 as they came in. And they got bigger and bigger from 28 seats to 110. They got longer. They got more powerful. They had more engines, you know. And they had a bigger range. Went up to 5,000 miles instead of 500. So a huge evolution all between, what, 1936, really post-war, though. 46 to 57. It was the glory day of the big props, they call them, the giant propeller airliners. During the same period, air travel just went nuts. A million total um, per each airline was doing a billion passenger miles in 46. Sounds like a lot, but that's one person, one mile. And, and these, all these big carriers were up to five to six billion, 5,000 to 6,000 million, you know, uh, 14 years later, 1960, without jets. And it's the same guys. It's the same guys. American uh, on top, United on their heels. TWA got big, but that's because they were flying overseas on, in addition to the U.S. But Pan Am grew dramatically too. So they're all popping along. Now, just so you know how they fit in, the smallest of those guys was five billion. The biggest of the next round was under two billion. And that was Delta, the green one, which had just shot up. Largely because of the growth of the South, but it was also a really well-run company. The other company at that time that was really well-run was Northwest. The company called Capital, I mentioned they were bought by United, made United the biggest. Uh, they, they were a player. And actually, Continental um, was the smallest and was really secondary for most of that time. Until he got into uh, Chicago and LA, he was way below these other guys. They still competed with the trains. So you pull out your Fortune 500 in 1955, the biggest transportation companies in America. American Airlines was 12th, Pan Am 15th. United 16th, TWA 18th. TWA was smaller than Greyhound in revenue. And all the others are railroads. The airline fleet, the end of the 50s, before jets, 594 Douglas, 228 Lockheed, all because of the Constellation. Convairs and Martins were little planes. Those were for short hops. So they really, they replaced the dying off DC-3s. And Boeing was not a player. Uh, nine planes, 1254. So we're 1958. Douglas owns the industry. On a global basis, if you look at passenger miles, nobody f ever really trusted Aeroflot's numbers, the Russian guys. But there's no question they had a huge empire. They're the only guys that didn't use American airliners. Uh, but after them, United Pan Am, American TWA, Eastern Air France, BOAC, Canadian guys, Delta, KLM, da -da -da -da, Northwest. So you know the industry as of then was still dominated by US companies. The airplane that should have changed the world. The first passenger jet, the de Havilland Comet. Boac flew the first one. Very proud of them. Big ads. They all, uh, basically, they all crashed and fell out of the sky and everybody died. They uh, hadn't gotten the engineering right on the windows. And the windows popped out and they lost pressurization. Early 50s. Basically destroyed the British aircraft industry. Except for their, their participation in the Airbus thing, the uh, British airliner industry never recovered from that. They came out with a Comet II a few years later, but it was too late. The guy that did change the industry, Bill Allen, Boeing 707. There's the one at the Smithsonian. He bet his company on that plane. Launch customer Pan Am helped him underwrite the research and everything at great expense. They flew it first. There is the first flight. Uh, I forget if this is leaving New York or landing in New York, coming in from London, but New York to London. Uh, I think it was October of 58. <laughs> it's got to be the first jet airliner, you know, safety card. Douglas was not stupid, and they came out with a DC-8, a wonderful airplane that actually 
uh, outlasted the 707, but the 707 sold a lot more. It came out earlier. And, and United, though, those, the, not United, DC-8s, which you can tell by this little thing on the nose, those are still flying. They still fly, fly freight all over the world. And, oh, and the other thing, I gotta tell one story. On the 707, the first one that came out, in Seattle, they have this big regatta, you know, out on Puget Sound and everything, the boat race. And Mr. Allen uh, had his, all his customers, all the airlines in the world, say, oh, come on, watch, guys. Uh, we're going to introduce the passenger jet. It's going to fly over in a few minutes. Oh, yeah, yeah. And the, and the test pilot that worked for Boeing did a barrel roll over the audience where the wings went all the way over like that. And Allen didn't find, and, and the plane survived and did fine. Uh, nobody knew it could do that. It had never been tested or anything. Um, <laughs> Allen didn't fire the test pilot, but he never talked to him again. Uh, and, and the DC-8 was the first supersonic airliner, because one of its test pilots took it into a dive and broke the sound barrier with it to see what it could do. No, I know, I know. Uh, uh, October 58, Pan Am, New York to London. Uh, two months later, a little airline called National. That's a great story. National was run by a guy named Maytag. His grandparents had had Maytang washing machines, and then he was a real innovator in the airline business, flew New York to Florida, and then his son uh, uh, changed the whole brewing industry by creating um, uh, Anchor Steam uh, in San Francisco, was the first microbrewery, so a real entrepreneurial family. And then American came in, and but see, Pat Patterson, the old accountant at United, the old banker, because the American guy was an old accountant, he was an old banker, he was more conservative, he said, I'm gonna wait till Douglas's comes out, because I know them better. And so he was six months late. That had to be really tough. Anyhow, so the, between 58 and 60, all the big airlines got jets. DC-8 was a beautiful airplane, and Douglas stretched it so they could hold more people, so it became the longest airplane, which was really cool. They made bigger versions. Uh, and then Douglas came out with the first small short hop jet, because at first, who, they didn't need that. So, oh, we just want to do New York to LA, but then they said people love jets. And so it's called the DC-9. Everybody flew DC-9s. A uh, later model was called the MD-10. If you fly American, you probably still fly some of those. It's amazing that they uh, still are running those guys. MD-80, MD-80, I'm sorry. And then Boeing came out with a three-engine, 727. Became the biggest selling airliner in history. Couldn't make them fast enough. It was a medium range. Then they came out with a 737, which has now become the biggest selling airliner in history, which is the short range jet, which they've also lengthened and made bigger so it can fly coast to coast. Um, and then uh, Pan Am came out with the 747. I mean, I'm sorry, Boeing, two of them there. Uh, the first one's early generation had a short top up above. The biggest one ever built, 747-400, has that huge top. It's one big airplane. Uh, Air India had the coolest windows and art. Uh, then uh, to answer the giant, the jumbo jet, uh, Douglas came out with a DC-10, and Lockheed came out with the L-1011 neither of which was a financial success, and then the, also a financial failure was the Concorde. Uh, data on the airliners, how fast. Uh, by 69, Douglas of the US airline fleet, 1600, almost 1100 were Boeings and 400 were Douglas. They basically lost the battle. They never recovered. They merged with uh, a McDonnell, a jet fighter maker, created a McDonnell Douglas, that didn't last either, and Boeing bought that. Um, so yeah, and it, they were just cranking up in Washington. Uh, they all keep growing, whole different trip. Uh, deregulation, 78, but even before that, they were working on Southwest Airlines. Crazy man named Herb Kelleher. He got the idea from a California airline called Pacific Southwest, which was, they were intrastate. They only flew within the state, so they hadn't, didn't have to deal with the feds. And the same was true of Southwest in its early days. So PSA later got bought and it fell apart, you know. They kept Southwest independent and strong, stronger than ever today. Uh, biggest airlines in the world today in passenger miles. This is 08. It was before all these mergers were finished, before the top one. But now, uh, Delta and Northwest, by their merger, two really messed up companies have created a giant messed up company. is <laughs> enormous. Air France and KLM, but they run them as two separate airlines. It's real interesting. I wouldn't have guessed the French could pull that off, but it's a pretty good operation. American, United, Continental, Lufthansa, Southwest, and British Airways. Okay, and that's passenger miles. Now, if you just count passengers, an airline like Southwest rises way up because they fly less miles per passenger. They're short hops. So there's Delta Northwest, Southwest. Uh, and, well, it'll take a few years with that gap, but uh, good chance Southwest will get to number one there. I've been saying that for years. American, United, Air France, Canada. It's kind of the same list after that, although the Asians begin to get in the list here with China Southern. Um, although, now here's what's interesting. Biggest U.S. transportation companies of Fortune 500 now, 
United, UPS, and FedEx. I, I, I make a case UPS and FedEx are both among the 10 greatest companies in the world um, in the same industry, much like I would add Coke and Pepsi in there. I think they learn a lot from competing with each other. UPS is so much bigger than any other transportation on, company on earth, it's not funny. Of course, it's both an airline and a trucking company, but FedEx is, well, it's got trucking too now, but it's mainly an airline. But they dwarf these other guys. And how much of that is from the internet and from Amazon and everything, but it's huge. And then airlines, and then we still got railroads. Br uh, Warren Buffett just bought this one. This is the one that serves Austin, Union Pacific, and the CSX, my hometown. The last three, the green ones, are the trucking, and the uh, bus lines are all bankrupt and gone. Last little thing, airport, evolution, Houston, Dallas Love Field, beautiful. Now, I think it's going to crash. <laughs> breakthrough, breakthrough. I, you know, there's a book called Boring Postcards, and I can't understand why this didn't make it into that book. Visions of the airports of the future over Manhattan in the giant city. But that's what we got, DFW. And the biggest airports in the world today and total number of people moving through them. Uh, doesn't change that much over the years. Atlanta, Chicago, uh, DFW are our big three. LAX is right in there. And the, Europe, the European ones are awfully strong in Tokyo. And I think that means I'm finally done. So uh, thank you. Thank you for your time.